doing this the last couple of rounds as we were getting our technological feet under us and just in the craziness of COVID. But I usually try and say a couple of words about research and science communication and how important this all is. And a lot of what we do in this building is based on translational research, but basic science really starts here in like this huge kind of maze that we don't know where the start sometimes and we don't know where the end is. Translational research has a goal that's somewhere at the middle of that. And that's really what we strive for in terms of a lot of what we do. And it's the basis of our um, community outreach um, seminar and programs. The idea is that we're pairing a basic scientist who's in that maze with a clinician who's got a goal at the end. And we're trying to convey how those things are linked together and how the process of translation happens, which is really critical for stem cell and regenerative medicine. So I wanna thank you again for being here tonight to hear us talk about that. Really important is that those scientific advances, lots of people see commercials for Pfizer and so on and Merck, and that's wonderful, but basic science research that runs from universities is where these things all start. This is just a slice of studies from 2012 to 2013, as you can see, the sorts of results that come out of public research institutions. Tens of thousands of patents, new startup companies generated, um, and um, uh, licenses issued to be able to pursue translational research. I thought I would highlight since it's the beginning of the quarter that um, right in your backyard, UCI is really a tremendous force for good in Orange County. It's a top 10 public institution, the number one best college um, in the United States by Money Magazine. And you can see the rest of the accolades here in this infographic. And we're very proud to be a part of that as the Stem Cell Research Center. We just had, in terms of our own personal points of pride, we had a huge event um, a couple of weeks ago our training grant to application to the newly funded, refunded California Institute for Regenerative Medicine was the top ranked application across the state. So we just received um, $5 million in funding for that, which will be used to support both, both graduate students, um, postdoctoral students, and a number of clinical fellowships. Again, giving you the sense of that basic science to clinical translation path. So how can I help people from the community ask us? Most of all, you can sign up, you can participate, you can be here, you can log in and listen to what we have to say and try and communicate about science and communication. Of course, you can also make a gift because this is very important to us and we have contact information here. So tonight, I'm very pleased um, to have a wonderful pairing, Dr. Park and Taluria Adams, doctors, Park and Adams, I should say, from UCI. Um, Next month, November 2nd, will be Tim Downing and Mike Zaragoza talking about stem cells and aging. So have that on your calendar and be looking forward um, for that event. And I also wanna to toss up a quick save the date for our major public lecture of the year that's linked to our stem cell symposium. We're very fortunate to have enticed Dr. Anthony Atala out for that who will be coming from Wake Forest Institute of Regenerative Medicine. He's a fantastic speaker. He has a number of TED Talks you can look up online. So hang on to that date. That's gonna be an evening lecture at the Irvine Barclay Theater. So tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce Taloria Adams, who's an assistant professor here at UCI. You can see she's been around the country with her bachelor's in chemical and life science engineering and a master's uh, uh, from Virginia Commonwealth, her master's from Mich Michigan Technological University and her PhD as well. We've been really pleased, um, I think three years ago to welcome here as a faculty member to UCI. She's gonna speak first, followed by her clinical collaborator, Dr. Suni Park who received her MD from Rush uh, Medical College, completed a residency at USC in internal medicine, and also fellowships in inflammatory bowel disease and gastroenterology at UCSD and Yale respectively. So again, we're extremely pleased to have her on faculty and um, grateful that she agreed to participate with us tonight. Just a couple of words on format, and this is my last slide. Because of the hybrid formats, um, we're going to run through both presentations kind of back to back. I'll just transition between our two speakers. Dr. Park is virtual tonight, but Dr. Adams is here and she's gonna lead us off. At the very end, we'll close their um, lectures and there'll be plenty of chance to ask questions um, and for discussion. If you're virtual and logging in to be able to listen to the presentations, never fear, you can put your questions into the Q&A box and we will take them, shout them out and get answers for you accordingly. 
So with that, um, I am going to stop my share and transition to Taloria. Maybe. Excellent. Oh, except I jumped through a bunch of your slides before and maybe can go back to the beginning. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Uh, can you hear me okay? Oh, but uh, no, you're now muted to log it. Okay. Is this better? That Got works. It. Okay. So um, thank you all for coming tonight to this community lecture. I'm happy to see you all in person and then also for the folks that are virtual. Um, one of the nice things about uh, giving a lecture in a virtual format is that some people that wouldn't necessarily be able to attend are in attendance. So I believe I have some family members who are online. And so I just want to say, hey, to them um, as we get started. And I also have some students from the class, uh, from a class that I'm teaching that are present as well. So thank you for coming. I appreciate your support. Um, so for tonight, I'm gonna talk about um, some work that my lab has been engaged in for quite some time. Um, we've been using a technology called dialectophoresis in order to push mesenchymal stem cells around. It's work that we've been engaged in for quite some time. And I'm, I'm happy to share with you some of the insights that we've been able to learn about these mesenchymal stem cells. Um, and then I also wanna just mention, this is not the first time that mesenchymal stem cells have been um, talked about during the community lecture. Uh, early last year, pre-pandemic, uh, mesenchymal stem cells and mesenchymal stem cell products were discussed um, as a potential treatment for pediatric lung disease. And so I'm gonna kind of reiterate some of the information that was provided during that talk because it sets the stage nicely for the work that my lab has been doing. Oh, okay. Click on it. Okay. So I'm going to start here. So mesenchymal stem cells were first defined by Arnold Kaplan in 1991. And so he defined these cells as cells that can turn into bone cells, they can turn into cartilage cells. And as you can see, based on this schematic, um, that they can turn into a variety of specialized cells. And so Arnold Kaplan has been working with mesenchymal stem cells for quite some time now, more than 30 years. And so one of the things he started to emphasize is that he wants to change the name of mesenchymal stem cells. And there's a reason why I'm bringing this up. So um, with these, I actually, I had the opportunity to attend a distinguished lecture that Arnold Kaplan gave at UCI um, about two years ago. And so in that talk, that was his focus. He focused on MSCs not being um, stem cells, but being better than stem cells. And so um, he really emphasized uh, changing the name to medicinal signaling cells to emphasize some of the properties of those cells. So uh, mesenchymal stem cells can um, uh, move to areas of injury or disease inside the body. And then they can release small molecules, which will uh, trigger a response. So they can um, trigger the immune system to support that injury or disease, or they can trigger uh, tissue regeneration. And so um, mainly, so at those sites of injury, uh, mesenchymal stem cells can secrete um, drug therapeutics that are uh, responsible for, um, for medicine, right? So uh, that's one of the emphasis, hence the change in the name. And so there's this ongoing conversation about how uh, mesenchymal stem cells are named and then also how they're characterized. And so researchers are really pushing for there to be a standardized approach to characterizing these cells uh, so that we can know what we have when we're working with them. And so that's kind of where the work that's done in my lab comes into the picture. And so I just want to show um, some data here. And so this is not data from my lab, but I have some data that uh, supports this data. And so, um, so this is a, a schematic. So it's a cluster um, profile of the gene expression of mesenchymal stem cells that have been obtained from different sources. And so you can see they're color coded um, based on the source. And so all of these are mesenchymal stem cells, but you can see that their gene profile does not overlap, right? So we have cord blood um, MSCs, 
And then we have um, bone marrow derived MSCs and they, don't, they do not overlap in their gene expression profile. And so I'm gonna show some data from my lab that also supports this data. All right, so, uh, so basically the properties of these um, mesenchymal stem cells are really dependent on the source that they come from. And then just to emphasize that more schematically, I have this schematic here. So mesenchymal stem cells, um, they're, so they're different or they're heterogeneous, and that's dependent on the source that they come from in the body. And so mesenchymal stem cells can be obtained from dental pulp tissue, umbilical cord tissue, bone marrow, and then also the heterogeneity or the differences in this cell will be dependent on the source or the, the person that they come from. So there's a donor dependence, and then there's a source dependence, uh, which leads to this heterogeneity of the cells. So then I wanna just start with the main points of this lecture and then I'll um, show you some data. Okay, so one of the main points of this lecture is that MSCs are a unique set of cells. And so hopefully that was illustrated in the first two slides that I went over. And so they are unique, um, but they differ based on how they're obtained. So what part of the body they come from or the donor that they come from. Um, there are engineering tools available such as dialectophoresis that allow us um, to gain insight into these differences or the heterogeneity of these cells. And so what we can do with these insights, so there's two things that we can do with dialectophoresis. One thing, um, we can characterize these cells to get more insights into the heterogeneity. And then we can take that information in order to sort subsets of those cells that we may be interested in for a therapy, uh, for a stem cell therapy. And then one area of interest um, in the field of medicine is to use mesenchymal stem cells to treat Crohn's disease, which will be highlighted in the next talk. So those are the three main points of this lecture today. So I wanna, so I mentioned dialectophoresis. So now I wanna tell you what, it, uh, what that is. And so dialectophoresis is a characterization tool um, and it allows us to move cells around or push cells around. So uh, for dialectophoresis, um, the way that we analyze the cells with this uh, technique is that we will suspend the cells in a solution. And in that solution, um, the cells are surrounded by ions or charges are in that solution. And then we can take that suspension of cells and put them into a really small device that has electrodes on the surface. And so then when we power those electrodes, the ions that are in that solution will move around the cells and the cells will move around or the cells will um, feel a force or be pushed around. And so um, that movement that we can see, I have this schematic here. So the cells will see two different behaviors. So either the cells will be pushed away from the electrodes, which is um, shown schematically here, or the cells will be pulled towards the electrodes. And that's shown in this bottom schematic. And so we're able to learn a lot about the cells based on this push pull movement that we can induce using these electrodes um, and, and having the cells suspended in these solutions. And so I do have um, a video just to show you what that movement looks like. So this is like the, the top view of a device. These black regions are electrodes within the device, which allows us to push the cells around. And then what I've highlighted in the circle here are the cells that are in this, um, that are suspended in a solution, and we're gonna see them move around. So now the electrodes are powered and you're gonna see the cells moving. And so you're gonna see some of the cells are gonna to move towards the center of the electrode. So that's them being pushed away from the electrodes. And then other cells are gonna move around the edges of the electrodes. And so they're being pulled towards those electrodes. And so um, this is how we can gain a lot of information about the heterogeneity of the cells. So the fact that within this one experiment, so this is a single experiment, where we've applied a single frequency. And within this experiment, since we see there are cells showing negative dielectrophoresis and they're showing positive dielectrophoresis, so they were pushed away from the electrodes and simultaneously some of the cells were pulled towards the electrodes. This is a visual indicator that this sample of cells are heterogeneous. The fact that we see the two behaviors at a single frequency. And so what we can do is we can broaden the range of frequencies that we examine the cells at to get a big picture view of how the cells respond to being pushed and pulled around within these electrodes. Okay, so then this um, diagram is gonna show the big picture view of when we expand those electrodes. I mean, expand the frequencies that we examine the cells at. So on the x-axis, you'll see there's a range of frequencies that we've tested. 
And then on the x-axis, you'll see this relative VP force or like the relative force that they feel when they're being pushed or pulled um, based on those electrodes being powered. And so the blue curve that I have here represents bone marrow derived mesenchymal stem cells. And then the pink curve that I have here represents adipose derived or fat tissue derived mesenchymal stem cells. And we chose to examine these two stem cell populations because they're commonly used in um, stem cell therapies or in clinical trials for therapies. So I want you to first look at the left-hand side or look on, yes, on the left-hand side of this plot. And so you can see that um, the response of these cells, the response of the spectra, the cells overlap, the, these curves overlap. And so here's the zero line. And so these negative values represent the cells that are being pushed away from the electrodes. So they're uh, negative values. And then the positive values represent the cells being pulled towards the electrodes. And so we see that the curve here is similar. And so we're able to um, give a quantitative value um, to this. And so this, the lower frequency values, this gives us information about the cell membrane. And so we're able to extract out a property called membrane capacitance. And that's gonna be the ability of a cell to store charge. And so um, because these curves are similar and overlap, the membrane ca uh, capacitance values for these two sources of mesenchymal stem cells are similar. And you can see that quantified here. But if you take a closer look, you can also see um, that we can examine and look at the slope of these curves. So we can look at the rate of change. We can look at the rate of the cell population um, experiencing negative dielectrophoresis or being uh, pushed away from the electrodes and then the rate of change of them switching and then uh, being pulled towards the electrodes. And so looking, examining the slope of this curve gives us information about whether the cells are heterogeneous or not. So just imagine if there's a homogeneous population of cells or all the cells are similar, then that rate of change is gonna be quick and you'll have a steeper slope. And if there are cells that are more different in the population, then that rate of change is gonna be slower and you'll have a more gradual slope. And so we were able to quantify this uh, the slope of this curve. And what you can see is that the slope for the bone marrow derived mesenchymal stem cells is different from the slope of the, meso of the adipose derived or the fat tissue derived mesenchymal stem cells. And so next we can also take a look at um, the spectra at higher frequencies. All right, and so um, some people may look at this curve and say, uh, this is not different, but in the field of dielectrophoresis, the spacing, the gap between these curves is actually a significant difference. And we're actually excited to see that separation in the curve. And just as a reference point, if you look on this side, you see that there's a very small, um, you know, very little differences here. And then over here, we have this separation. So at the higher frequencies, we're able to gather information about the cytoplasm of the cell. And the fact that we see this separation in the spectra tells us that the um, cytoplasm of these cells may be different. And so we quantified those values and we can see that the bone marrow derived and the adipose derived stem cells have different cytoplasm conductivity values. So with these metrics, we have the transient slope that we looked at. We, had, we looked at the membrane capacitance and we looked at the cytoplasm conductivity. And so these are good metrics that we're able um, to gather from that DP spectra or the dielectrophoresis spectra. And these are good metrics for assessing the heterogeneity of these mesenchymal stem cells. But we don't wanna just look at the electrical properties that we're able to uh, quantify. We also wanna be able to correlate that to the biological function of the cells. So we also did some bioassays on these cells. And so um, one thing that we did was we differentiated the cells and we looked at how the cells turned into, how well they turned into bone cells and how well they turned into fat cells. So in the top two images, we have the two sources of MSCs and they've been differentiated towards bone cells or osteocytes. And then in the bottom two images, we have uh, the two sources of MSCs that have been differentiated towards fat cells or adipocytes. And so what we can see from these images is that both sets of these MSCs um, differentiate very well into bone and fat cells. And the fact that we see the, uh, these cell populations turn into two different cell types is an indicator of their heterogeneity. And so this um, supports our DP profile of the cells, the information that we gathered from that spectra, but we wanna have more information to correlate with our DP profile of the cells. And so we also looked at some gene expression of the cells. 
And so here I'm showing a bone cell marker collagen one. And we looked at how this, the expression of collagen one changed over time. So you'll see on the X axis, we start with day two and we go up to day 16. And then we look at the pattern of the expression of those cells. And so from day two to day 16 for these bone marrow derived cells, we can see that the gene expression for collagen one decreases. And then if we look at the gene expression for the adipose derived MSCs, the collagen one expression increases from day two to day 16. So those patterns are different. We also looked at a marker for, um, uh, for fat cells, so adiponectin. And so you can see the pattern for both the bone marrow and the adipose derived MSCs that they look similar, but the magnitude and the relative expression is different between the two. So we see some, we see differences and we see that both of these um, sources of cells differentiate into fat and bone cells very well. And then when we look at the gene expression of the cells, we see that they're different. And so think back to that first or the second slide where I showed that cluster plot of the gene expression profile of the um, different sources of MSCs, and those were different. And then here we're showing that our gene expression profiles of these cells are also different. But um, these differences are good because the gene, this, uh, these profiles for the gene expression correlate well to our, um, our data that we've collected using dielectrophoresis. And so what can we do with that information? So uh, remember, there's a conversation now about how we name mesenchymal stem cells and how we define them biologically. And so what dielectrophoresis provides us from a standpoint of characterization, we have these markers, uh, membrane capacitance and cytoplasm conductivity, as well as the transient slope that we can use uh, to define these cells or characterize these cells. The other thing that we can do with this information is that we can design strategies to sort subsets of these cells. So say we wanted to uh, use bone marrow derived MSCs to treat a specific disease, or we wanna use fat tissue derived MSCs to treat a specific disease, then we can also use dielectrophoresis to target a subset of those cells um, to achieve that purpose or for that purpose. And so here's just a strategy that I've outlined. So um, one thing with the mesenchymal stem cells is that they range in size. So bone marrow um, derived MSCs have a range of size in, in terms of the diameter of the cells. And then also adipose derived, they have a range in size for the diameter of the cells. And so that range in size that we've seen is also an indicator of heterogeneity. So um, one thing that we could do is we could sort the cells based on size using a spiral channel, um, a spiral micro channel. And so then if we use a spiral micro channel here, then uh, larger cells will come out of the channel at a later time point than the smaller cells. And then what we can do is we can take those two or three subpopulations of cells based on the size, and then we can put them into a microfluidic device that again has electrodes that can be powered and they can push and pull cells either towards the electrodes or pull, uh, push them away from the electrodes in order to sort subsets of cells. So here's a strategy that we could use in order to sort subsets of MSCs for therapeutic treatments. And so uh, one thing that we could do is that we could target subsets of MSCs that have increased immunosuppressive activity or an, you know, a increased capacity to support the immune system for the treatment of autoimmune diseases. And so one option would be to um, use mesenchymal stem cells as a treatment for Crohn's disease. There are ongoing clinical trials um, looking at this. And so just to quickly, briefly highlight, um, Crohn's disease is inflammation of the digestive tract. And so um, people who have Crohn's disease can suffer from abdominal pain, diarrhea, um, fatigue, weight loss, and malnutrition. And so the next talk is gonna get into um, a clinical trial that's using mesenchymal stem cells to treat Crohn's disease. So I'll stop there. And then I just wanna give some brief conclusions so um, screening mesenchymal stem cells heterogeneity is critically important for the development of robust, of robust stem cell therapies, because you can see that these cells look very different based on the uh, source that they're derived from. And then we have the engineering tools such as dielectrophoresis that allows us to have a quantitative assessment of their heterogeneity. And so I just listed the metrics that we've used here. So looking at the slope of the spectra, um, quantifying the membrane capacitance, and then also quantifying the cytoplasm connectivity of the cells. And then with that information, we can also use dielectrophoresis as a method to sort the stem cells um, to reduce the heterogeneity. So maybe there's a subset of cells that have you know, an increased immune support, and then that would be a better treatment for uh, autoimmune disease. 
And then lastly, MSCs do have clinical relevance in the treatment of Crohn's disease. And so I do wanna show uh, my lab, the research group. And so um, these are students that I've been working with. They're all very, they're all excellent. And then um, this work is funded by the National Science Foundation. And I thank you all for your attention and I'll be happy to answer questions at the end. So thank you so much, Gloria. That was just, I hope, um, so super clear, at least for me it was. I am going to invite Dr. Park to share her screen. Remember, everyone will take questions all at the end together. Dr. Park, if you can go ahead, we'll just make sure that you're up and running here. Can everyone see this? Go to full screen, I think. Oh, it looks good, looks fine from here. I think it's better for our recording. Okay, here you go. Okay. Okay, um, thank you so much for the invitation to present. My name is Sunny Park. I'm one of the assistant clinical professors in medicine uh, and clinician gastroenterologist at the UC Irvine Medical Center. So we will discuss the types of stem cells used in GI research, and we will talk about their applications, specifically in liver disease, Crohn's disease, and fistulizing GI tract disease. We hope that you will gain an understanding about how stem cell therapies can be applied in these certain GI diseases. Stem cells have multiple sources from which they originate, as um, Dr. Adams um, just mentioned in her presentation. They can come from the bone marrow. They can also come from the adipose. The GI tract mucosa also has stem cells in the glands and the crypts, and the liver can also be a source of stem cells. Among these, the mesenchymal stem cells have good replication potential and anti-inflammatory activity, and they have been mostly studied in the GI diseases. As you can see here, you can obtain hematopoietic stem cells, which become T cells and B cells, red and white blood cells. And you can also obtain multipotent mesenchymal stromal cells from the bone marrow. Both types of cells have, have been used in research. Some, some of the experimental studies in the animal models have been performed for um, the following indications. They've been performed for gastroesophageal reflux disease, peptic ulcer disease, liver cirrhosis, bile duct injury, small bowel regeneration, and fecal incontinence. With regards to human clinical trials looking at the application of stem cells in gastrointestinal disease, we have more of the data thus far in liver disease or liver failure, Crohn's disease, and fistulizing disease, which may be a subset of Crohn's disease. We'll talk more about those specifically. So how do stem cells work? They regulate other cells by inhibiting the local immune response and preventing excessive fibrosis and apoptosis. They are thought to stimulate proliferation of certain cells, for example, the hepatocytes. They enhance breakdown of scar tissue and promote angiogenesis. They are also immunomodulators of B and T cell function, and they have been shown to migrate to damaged tissue in the animal models. We will discuss liver disease. So chronic liver disease and cirrhosis account for greater than 44,000 deaths in the United States and 2 million de deaths worldwide each year. The most common etiologies include hepatitis B, hep C, alcohol-related liver disease, and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, or NAFLD. Acute on chronic liver failure mortality rate ranges from about 30 to 78% based on the severity and extent of organ failure. This is a schematic illustration of the progression of liver disease from mild fibrosis to cirrhosis, and then ultimately to liver failure or need for liver transplantation. So Chen and colleagues performed a meta-analysis looking at 198 acute liver failure patients with hepatitis B treated with mesenchymal stem cells compared to standard medical therapy. And the stem cell treatment significantly reduced mortality at week 12, 
And this is an example of one such study um, looking at the use of stem cells in liver disease, but all of the similar studies need longer term follow up data and larger numbers of patients to confirm safety. Another application of stem cells used in GI disease is in inflammatory bowel disease. Stem cell therapy is an emerging and promising field in IBD, which includes both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. IBD is a type of chronic inflammatory disease that results in remitting and relapsing symptoms of abdominal pain, increased stool frequency, and anemia. Remember that IBD is different from irritable bowel syndrome. An estimated 1.6 million people have IBD in the United States, and as many as 5% of all cases are in children under the age of 20. As you can see on the map um, to the right, the areas of high, highest prevalence are in Canada, United States, Australia, and Europe. The exact cause of inflammatory bowel disease is not completely understood as it is not entirely attributable to single genes. It's actually an interaction between the genes, the immune system, and the environment. So the immune system mounts an inappropriate um, response to the intestinal tract and then the environmental triggers may initiate a harmful immune response among patients who um, are born with inherited genes that make them more susceptible to this disease. These are the disease features of Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, which are both um, types of inflammatory bowel disease. As you can see on the left, Crohn's disease can affect the small bowel or colon in patchy distribution. Up to 30% of patients can also have perianal fistula involvement in addition to colonic or small bowel involvement. On the right, you see ulcerative colitis. This affects different parts of the colon, whether it be the entire colon, the distal part, or just the rectum. And about 10 to 15% of patients actually have an indeterminate type of inflammatory bowel disease where they straddle both features of Crohn's and or ulcerative colitis. And you really can't make a determination as to what type of IBD they exactly have. On the left um, pictured here is a normal healthy colon. And on the right, you can see um, by contrast that there are active ulcers, friability, loss of vascular pattern. And this is oftentimes appreciated in patients with inflammatory bowel disease, both Crohn's and UC. Now, the traditional approach to therapy is focused on selecting the appropriate medication for the severity of disease. So you can see here on this pyramid, the greater the severity of disease, the more immunosuppression you're going to need to, to control this disease. So you go up the pyramid, and as you go up, um, all of these therapies actually have higher immunosuppression. An inflammatory response in the gut subsequently leads to inflammatory mediators that then send signals downstream. This diagram here that you're seeing shows the major pathways thought to drive disease pathogenesis and the corresponding drug targets in IBD. And as you can see, just to select a few, you, we have a couple therapies that target the TNF pathway. We've also um, have a therapy that targets the interleukin 12 and 23 pathway here. And then we have a therapy that targets the JAK-STAT pathway. And then we have a gut-directed therapy that um, targets the alpha-4 beta-7 integrin pathway. And these are the different therapeutic targets that are um, targeted in treatment of inflammatory bowel disease. Unfortunately, there's no magic bullet when it comes to therapy for inflammatory bowel disease. Not all patients who initiate these immunomodulator therapies respond to treatment. And patients who are refractory to medical therapy ultimately require surgery. And that's where stem cell um, therapy comes in as an emerging field in the therapeutics for IBD. IBD is characterized by an immune system in an abnormally overactive state. These overactive T helper cells promote an exaggerated macrophage and neutrophil response whose activation subsequently leads to uncontrolled production of inflammatory cytokines. Mesenchymal stem cells have been studied in IBD due to their immunomodulatory capability, as previously mentioned by Dr. Adams. They are noted to be helpful in modulating the immune system via promotion of T cells, specifically the Treg cells, which are usually found to be deficient in IBD patients. T 
Rex cells are able to distinguish self from non-self antigens. So these have great potential to help IBD patients. Gonzalez and colleagues um, found that a systematic infusion of either human or mouse mesenchymal stem cells ameliorated the severity of colitis in mice with active colitis. Subsequently, in a case series in 1998, patients with Crohn's disease and leukemia achieved remission of Crohn's and leukemia after bone marrow transplantation. This subsequently led to further research in stem cell therapy, and a phase one study was performed in patients with refractory Crohn's disease who received autologous stem cell infusion. Furthermore, other phase two studies studying infusion of mesenchymal stem cells in patients with moderate to severely active Crohn's disease showed disease remission without many adverse events. This then paved the way for additional phase two and three clinical trials that are currently being conducted at this time. The major issue with most of these studies are the small number of patient participants, the variation in the stem cell products, and the lack of larger controlled studies. Crohn's disease is a transmural disease, as we mentioned. Inflammation at the intestinal mucosal levels can subsequently progress further um, transmurally and then subsequently develop into these fistulas, these connections, um, where you can connect lumen to adjacent organs or lumen to other lumen. On the right here on this diagram, you can see that these fistula tracts have developed perianal disease, where part of the rectal mucosa um, has ulcerated and formed a tract to the outside world. This can also set up um, perianal abscesses and fluid collections and infectious um, complications. Stem cell therapy has also shown some promise in fistulizing disease. And um, fistulizing disease can be a subset of Crohn's disease, but you can also have fistulizing disease that's independent of Crohn's. In 2002, the first intralesional inoculation of autologous stem cells was used to seal a refractory and recurrent rectovaginal fistula in a Crohn's disease patient. Subsequently, phase one and two studies have studied Crohn's as well as non-Crohn's patients with fistulas to determine whether injection of stem cells to the fistula site can actually heal the fistula tract. Currently, there are some phase three trials underway looking at the use of stem cell therapy as a tool to treat these fistulas, and we actually have one of these clinical trials currently undergoing recruitment here at the UC Irvine Medical Center. In summary, stem cell therapy has yielded some promising preliminary results in clinical studies. And we hope that you were able to learn the different ways in which stem cell therapy could be used in gastrointestinal and liver disease. Thank you. Can you see the questions, Eileen, or would you like me to forward some questions? Okay, you're good. Cool. All right. Ah, uh, that's what I want to see. That makes more sense. There you go. Thank you. Okay, so we have a few questions that have come in, you can see on the screen. First, I'd like to thank um, both of our speakers. I think for me, that was really super clear. We don't always know <laughs> where it's gonna go, um, but I really appreciate your time tonight. We have a couple of questions to go through. And then if you don't mind, I'll take a couple of these and mix it up back and forth with the audience. So Robert Miller asks, hello for the bone marrow, humans, stem cell markers that were shown. Can I have an explanation for why the expressions are inverse? Taloria, I'm guessing that's to you. Does this question ring a bell for you? I think so. Okay. Okay. So why were they? Okay. So why were the markers, why the expressions are inverse? 
So, um, so that's a good question. I don't have a, um, I don't have an explanation as to why for the bone marrow derived. Um, so I believe you're talking about the collagen one marker. So at day two, day two to day 16, the collagen expression decreased, but then for the adipose derived day two to day 16, the collagen marker increased. Um, and so I don't have a direct explanation for that, um, but we did look at the, so the cells were differentiated over the course of 21 days. And so that's the gene expression that we saw over that time period. So, um, and so as the cells were uh, differentiated and aged in our uh, in vitro. So I don't have a strong explanation as to exactly why that is the case, but those are the results that we saw um, for the study. And it was, um, it was, so the data that I showed, that's the N equal to three. And so the, and it was uh, statistically significant with the stars that I showed as well, but I'm not exactly sure as to why. That's something that we'd have to look at more, but we were just really interested. We were really excited to see that those patterns were different and that those differences matched with our DP profile for the cells. So to worry, maybe I'm not sure I have that question, right? But maybe I can ask a follow-up that might make sense to the audience. Okay. And that is, um, I think you did a really great job of explaining the idea of how um, it might be the case that you have a, a heterogeneous population. So the zancomal stem cells, not all the same, even in the same dish, right? Mm -hmm. So you can separate by size, you can separate by charge. That's telling you about membrane properties. Um, but I think also when you have different sources, like different individuals or different originating sources like fat, versus bone marrow, as an example, those cells come with kind of an imprint, mm -hmm. right? So maybe you want to say a word about that because I think that probably okay. comes into play. Okay, yes. Yeah. So then, so for the for the adipose derived cells, they have more of a tendency to make fat cells. So then it would take longer for those cells, even with the differentiation cues that they had, it would take a little bit longer for them to respond and start producing the bone cells. And so, that probably is a part of the reason why we saw um, it take a little bit longer for the expression to increase, uh, the relative expression to increase for the collagen marker. And then for the bone cells, they naturally, or well, the bone marrow derived from mesenchymal stem cells, they want to make those bone cells. And so they were able um, to do that within the time frame. Yeah. And that actually hits on a really cool thing we've talked about before, and I think we'll have another community lecture coming up maybe in the spring. Um, that's the idea of this imprinting process that cells come with, that they're not all tabula rasa, they're not all the same. And that um, imprint is called their epigenetics, and mm -hmm. that's been a vastly emerging area of research that's really critical for stem cell biology. On the basic science level, I didn't do it. <laughs> As you can see, I'm way over here. <laughs> I didn't do it either. Okay. Um, <laughs> Um, basic biology and for clinical uh, translation, right? So, to worry, I remember one more question from online, and then we'll go out to the audience. Okay. Here. And Sid Dollar, who's our former director and is on tonight, asked whether you could push and pull cells like this in vivo also. Is this something that we can think about only in a, a dish, like it's a pre sorting process, or is there some application that would, could or would come into play in an in vivo setting? That's a good question. So <laughs> what That's I why I related. Yeah. So um so what I can tell you is that um so we use these electrodes to produce an electric field to move the cells around. And so there is work with our uh, folks have used electric fields um as a treatment for cancer. And so not necessarily to I guess, recruit the cells to a, a specific area or move them around, but as a way to, um, uh, to change the integrity of the cell membrane to cause uh, cell death. And so, you know, I could probably imagine a space where if the, if the electrodes are placed in the right part of the body, where it allows for movement um, to happen, where there's a, a fluid flow and movement, then yes, maybe we could use it. Um, to look to push and pull the cells around, but I think that that's a, a, a far. <laughs> I think 
graph. Oh, well, so I have a, a colleague, a long time collaborator, who I think is looking at a similar, te similar technology for like sensing cancer cells mm -hmm. right? as a way to augment um, sensitivity. Mm -hmm. So it is kind of a cool concept. Yeah, yeah. Any questions from the audience? Perfect. Let me give you the oh. mic. Just to thank you. So um, I think this was touched on a little bit, uh, but it's kind of a two-part question. Okay. Uh, first, what, were all of the stem cells sourced from the same person in your lab? So they were not. They were not. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think that kind of answers my um, all up question that like, do we see characteristics that are consistent across like multiple sources, like, or I should say multiple people, like different people, um, like doing like a bone marrow, like genetic information, right? right. <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah, so there are some surface markers. So um, people have used flow cytometry to look at markers on the surface of the cells that will be similar, that, you know, that are similar um, uh, source to source. So there are some similarities there. And then there's actually, I would encourage you. So say your name again for me one more time. Alan. Alex, so you're in my class. So I would encourage you, <laughs> I'll give you an assignment kind of. I would encourage you, there's a, a recent publication. You're supposed to incentivize <laughs> Well, <laughs> extra credit. <laughs> so there's a recent publication where they looked at uh, mesenchymal stem cells that were derived from the same person and then different sources. And they show the differences that existed within uh, those samples from the same person. And so it's, it's interesting to look at and to think about, um, but there are some surface markers uh, for the cells that will be consistent, you know, that are consistent from uh, source to source, but those markers also overlap with other types of cells. Okay. Yeah. Are the indications like a lot tighter if they are, I'm not sure if you remember the results from the paper, but are oh. Like tighter in terms of um, yeah, less variation in like the data if they're mm. from the same source. No. Oh really? Yeah, no. yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's my question. Mm -hmm. All right, well, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, have these these storage cells already used for transplantation to a person? That is also a good question. And to my knowledge, I do not think so. Right, because uh, for, yes, they have not been used, but that would be the end goal. The goal would be to sort cells and then um, have them go into a transplantation study. Yeah. Have they been used in animal models? Uh, not, not cells sorted specifically by dielectrophoresis. Yeah. Uh, I have actually two questions. Okay. So the first one is uh, you show like a video about using the electron uh, to like push the cell. So I'm wondering why what some of the cells are positive and some of the cells are negative. Yeah, so that's a really good question. And so um, my answer to that will be the what's out on the surface of the cells. And then also, um, okay, so one thing I should say is that that video that I showed you are uh, bone marrow derived stem cell, uh, mesenchymal stem cells that were analyzed at a different time point than those, the spectra that I showed. So those are two different samples. And then the differences that we see, so when we see the cells exhibiting two behaviors at a single frequency, um, I would attribute that to what's out on the surface of the cell. So the different proteins that are out there and then the different, the sugars that could be out on the surface of the cells. And so that's actually work that is ongoing um, in the lab is looking at what uh, contributes to those differences and allows us to see the two different behaviors. But there has been work done on neural stem cells that shows that the sugar patterns on the surface of the cells are correlated to that response that we'll see. Can, can I interject one from online and then we'll come back to you guys? Um, so Dr. Park, in the q and I'm gonna, I'm gonna toss this question to you. In the Q&A, there is a question, although it kind of pertains to Taloria's lecture, I think it falls into your daily way, about um, what is it that an environmental factor might be that could be influencing um, the behavior of cells or having an impact, for example, in Crohn's disease and colon cancer for the stem cells. 
because those are internal organs. So how is it that factors from the environments can be making a difference there? Does that make, question make sense to you? Okay. Yeah. So, um, so you know, basically the the re, the way that they know that environmental factors um, impact um, the pathogenesis of disease and um, you know flares versus remission is because. Um, based on these epidemiologic studies, they know that patients, for example, who have had, um, you know, certain bacterial infections, like C. diff is a big um, infection that can cause flares, um, history of NSAID use, um, history of hormone therapy, or whether you're a cigarette smoker, all of these environmental factors that are somewhat controllable, that are non-genetic, non-inherited, um, based on the epidemiologic studies, um, show evidence that they can somewhat uh, impact the, um, the disease. Whether someone is born into a family where your mom or dad may have inflammatory bowel disease, you may not necessarily end up developing inflammatory bowel disease, but all you needed was that trigger, for example. You went camping, you got a bug, and now you can't recover. Everyone else recovered, but you can't. Those are environmental factors that, ha that impact um, how you develop the disease rather than an inherent um, you know, um, factor that you're born with. I hope that answers the question. This is a great answer for me. So Gloria, do you wanna add anything to that? About the environmental factors yeah. that may... Well, how can you have an environmental factor that's affecting like a cell that's within your body or an organ that's within your body, right? So I think Dr. Park's answer was a great one. You and I who do things mm -hmm. in, in in vitro models in a dish, we struggle with this all the time because we try and model those factors, right? Yeah, so in terms of environmental factors, so um, if there is some sort of injury, right, to a tissue, and, and that can be mimicked in, in a dish, if there's an injury to a tissue, then uh, different molecules will be released to help support the repair. And so then those molecules are in the environment and that can impact the functionality of cells that are in direct contact with that injury or cells that are close and nearby. Exactly. And yeah. so that brings up a good point that there's you know factors that are truly outside in the environment. And we talk about the micro environment that mm -hmm. cells live in and how that's in the Perfect. I'll come back to you. I won't forget. Dr. Park, uh, I was wondering about the environmental um, causes as well, but not the biological side, more the psychological side. Uh, is anybody looking at adverse childhood experiences, complex trauma, and PTSD as uh, part of that? Yeah, so. Um... There certainly is clinically when you talk to patients and you um, discuss, you know, their journey um, with the disease. Certainly, there seems to be a relationship between, um, you know, emotional stressful events in your life and symptoms. You know, having worsening GI symptoms. As of now, um, the research doesn't specifically point to you know, stress itself causing, um, stress alone causing flares and inflammatory bowel disease. But if that stress comes from, for example, dehydration or changes in altitude, there is some evidence um, to show that that can actually cause um, and trigger flares. So I guess it would depend on the type of stress or the type of um, stimulus that may, um, affect the immune response and as a result cause flares. Great. I had I know at least one more question over here. Come back. Okay. Uh, so my question is about um to show a couple of because I have a couple of um microfluidic devices. It's just one of them is like um going through a passage and then uh that uh, the lines is green. I'm just curious about like how that works. How is that? Uh, how you utilize the uh, 
positive and negative charge of the cell to do that? Like, can you like uh, explain that a little bit? Yeah. So you want to know more about how the device functions, right. how that device functions. So, um, so on that slide, I showed there was a region of the device that had electrodes, and then at the end, that a uh, single microchannel split off into three like exit microchannels or three outlets. And so the way that that works is when those electrodes are powered and the cells are pushed or pulled, the cells will either stay on the walls of that microchannel, which means that they'll be directed towards the two um, outlets that went off to the, to the sides. And then for cells that were pushed towards the center region of those electrodes, they'll, they're like, they're focused. And so it'll be a straight line focusing them to that middle outlet channel. So with the fluid flow that's introduced into the device, plus the functionality of those electrodes, that allows us to direct cells either to the middle channel or they'll be directed towards the outer channels. And all that's based on the, um, the, the properties of the cells, like the physical properties of the cells that we can um, examine using dilatophoresis. Yeah. So I have one. What's the advantage of dielectrophoresis compared to like conventional waves that one might sort cells? So we have a core facility in the building, for example, and we sort cells by measuring up with antibodies that recognize things on their cell surface, and we can make them fluorescent so we can pick and choose what combination of cell surface proteins they're expressing. So why would you do dielectrophoresis instead of that? Okay. So so there are a couple of reasons to use dielectrophoresis instead of um, fluorescent activated cell sorting. So one, we don't label or tag the cells with anything. And so we just take the cells, um, we detach them from the plate that they're grown on, and then we suspend them in our solution, which is just a solution of sugar and water and a little bit of salt to tune the conductivity. And then we're able to sort the cells. So we don't label the cells, which reduces the cost of the cell sorting or the characterization. And then it also reduces the time. So the, our cell prep time is maybe like 45 minutes, depending on how skilled you are uh, with cell culture. Um, so those are two advantages. And then another advantage is that uh, when the cells pass across those electrodes and they experience that force or the electric field, it doesn't compromise their viability. So the cells are still healthy and we can work with them after um, cell sorting or after characterization. And so that's also another advantage. Uh, because when cells go through fluorescent activated cell sorting, the viability can be uh, decreased quite significantly. And uh, with uh, dialectrophoresis, that's not the case. As long as the, the exposure times are short. And so when the cells are flowing through our devices, the exposure times are definitely short. So like under five minutes. So the super cool thing about that, maybe especially for students in Dr. Adams' class, right, is this is where engineering and cell biology yeah. Right. So that's how technology advances. And that's how not to put up as a science, but our transition work advances. Dr. Park, just in the last couple of minutes, there are at least two questions that have come in for you online. So um, one of them is um, why the incidence may be so high in the North American and Northern European population from the map that you showed. And um, the second, which I'll just get out all at once, and that'll be your job to remember. The second is whether you can summarize any of the current clinical trials that are ongoing um, at UCI um, that are involving stem cell therapies for these types of conditions. Yeah, thank you. Um, so for the first question, um, uh, I'll answer the last question first. So. Um, so some of the clinical trials that are ongoing at UCI currently, um, we do have a stem cell injection therapy that looks at um, injecting the fistulas in the perianal area for Crohn's disease patients and injecting these fistula tracts with stem cells to help close them off. And so uh, currently we're recruiting um, for this trial and um, there are other trials. If you go to clinicaltrials.gov, you can actually pull up. There are so many trials that use stem cells in various capacities. Um, you know, some of the trials are looking at injecting stem cells into strictures, for example, um, that can also occur as a result of Crohn's disease. Um, there are other um, stem cell treatments that are being used for mucosal disease in colonic um, ulcerative colitis or colonic Crohn's disease, rather than just fistulizing or stricturing disease. 
Um, yeah, there are plenty of you know, um, studies that are being carried out right now. And we just need more data before this becomes prime time and before it is offered. Um, I saw one of the questions um, asking about whether these stem cells can be off, you know, off the shelf and get them from companies, but currently um, we cannot. They, they are only used under clinical trials and with clinical trials because of the fact that we don't have long-term safety data yet on how they interact um, for patients who um, have these chronic diseases. So definitely want to be able to, um, you know, follow them long term. Um, and then, I'm sorry, what was the first question, Dr. Anderson? The, for, well, the other question that I posed at least was about the incidence and how different yes. it is in North America and Northern Europe. Thank you, yeah. So. Um, the reason why some of the North American and European countries have um, a higher incidence of IBD um, most likely comes from um, the fact that some of the, there's genetic um, predisposition. So we tend to see more Crohn's and ulcerative colitis in patients who do have um, like a European, North European background. Um, you know, genetically speaking. And then on top of that, some of the environmental um, factors that patients are exposed to when they live in these areas may also have to do with why um, the numbers are higher in these locations. But having said that, the um, demographics for IBD has changed a lot over the years, and we are seeing more and more um, other patient populations getting them. We see them a lot here in Southern California in Hispanic and Asian populations as well. Um, although historically, um, you know, it was mostly like a European and North American Canadian uh, type of um, disease. So um, some of it may, may also have to do with, um, you know, are maybe are we too clean, for example? Are, are we keeping our children away from bacteria? And as a result, is that having a negative impact on our immune system when we grow up? We're not exposed to all of these antigenic um, you know, stimuli that we need in order to mature our immune system. Um, so there are thoughts around that as well. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for that. I just wanna invite and ask if there are any other questions from our audience that are here tonight. Great, I see one more. And um, I apologize, we're not gonna to get to um, anyone else's question online, but I wanna make sure that we get at least one more. Hi, my name is Bolle. I technically have two questions. One is more of a clinical. What is environmental impact of the microbial um, microbes, whether it is in the digestive tract or outside on the skin, for example? You just mentioned the fact that maybe do not have enough exposure to the microbes. The other one is more of uh, for uh, Dr. Adams is you mentioned use of electric field. Was there any work done with use of magnetic field for separation? So Dr. Park, let's go ahead and start with you. First question. Yeah, so there definitely is um, some evidence to suggest that um, the interior microbiome of our guts, as well as what's around us and surrounding us in the outside world, um, the, um, the interplay between our microbial gut uh, flora, as well as the outside world, can um, bring about, you know, a certain um, stimuli, you know, within your gut that causes you to um, become sick or to develop inflammatory bowel disease. So, um, you know, there is, there's, there's a lot, um, you know, even in patients who, for example, have had colectomies as a result of advanced inflammatory bowel disease, sometimes the, the microbiome and the, the gut bacteria that compose their gut actually can, um, change their clinical outcomes. For example, um, they may have more, um, we have something called pouchitis in patients who've had colectomies. 
And um, some of these patients, depending on, you know, whether they've been exposed to antibiotics and they wipe, wipe out all the bacteria and the good content or whether they're on probiotics, these can in turn affect the clinical outcomes and whether they have disease that's in remission or whether they have recurrent pouchitis or recurrent infection. And certainly we know um, even in normal population without IBD that if you give antibiotics repetitively, that um, that's, that sets patients up for recurrent opportunistic infections that um, you know, normally don't plague the, the colon um, in general. So um, there is definitely an interplay between the interior microbiome as well as the outside world in the disease. That was a great answer. Thank you so much. So Gloria, the question to you is um, about why can you sort by magnetic field mm -hmm. as opposed to electric field? Yes. So there's definitely sorting using uh, like magnetic activated cell sorting. And so I would say um, the choice to use dialectophoresis over that method would be the same um, because of the use of labels of the cells. Um, so that would be the advantage to choose dialectophoresis over magnetic activated cell sorting. And there's also um, work where you can, you can implement magnetic um, sorting within microfluidic devices. That's just not an area that I've um, explored a lot, but it is possible. And, and there are people doing work in that area, yeah. So um, with that, I think we're around 10 minutes over. We did wonderful in terms of timing. Thank you again so much, Dr. Adams and Dr. Park. Um, there's one question online about Parkinson's and Parkinson's disease trials. I would just um, refer you to have a look actually at our last community lecture, which was Dr. Momoko, Momoko Watanabe and Claire Henstrup, who's our chair of neurology, who spoke um, in part about Parkinson's disease and some current clinical trials of stem cell therapies for Parkinson's disease, which we run in part through the Alpha Stem Cell Center. So um, with that, thanks everyone so much for joining us. Thanks for joining us online and very much thank you for joining us in person and um, thanks to our speakers. Thank Good you. Night.